Welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Bill Murphy, your host of the Red Zone podcast. If you are in business, if you are a business IT leader, like a CIO, a CISO, a VP of IT, any derivative of an IT business leader, or any executive that has to convince, persuade, cajole, or, or, any, or any derivative of that uh, influence others, which means every one of you, you're going to love this, this episode today. Dan Rome is my guest, and Dan has just written a new book called The Pop-Up Pitch. Dan is a business visualization and communication clarity expert, and he has worked with, he works with big brands, and he works with big companies to solve complex problems like Google, Microsoft, uh, Applied Physics Lab, Boeing, Gap, IBM, the U.S. Navy, United States Senate, the White House. And the, the key is here solving complex problems with simple pictures. So my goal with this is to introduce you to someone who's really changing the world as we get faster and faster and more and more complex and there's more and more information. We don't have to buy into that when we're trying to influence or persuade others with our pre- with our PowerPoint presentations. And Dan is going to step people step you through in, in the talk today of how he's been doing that for for 20 plus years. He goes, I help managers and executives think better, work faster, and communicate more effectively by helping them think with their eyes. I love that, helping them think with their eyes. Drawings bring simplicity to where it didn't exist before. Simplicity brings clarity, but it also brings calm. In an agitated, turbulent world, world, visual stories ground you and your teams and your customers. If you're getting prepared to go into a board meeting, if you're fighting for a seat at the table, if you want a seat at the table, then doing a better job with your storytelling is a critical skill to have. He's also the founder of napkinacademyschool.com, the world's most popular online visual thinking and storytelling program. And so as you continue to develop this this superpower skill of of developing visual clarity with, with your stories and your presentations, this is going to be a good resource for you, and it'll be in the in the show notes. I'll have a link to where you can go, not only for his book, but also for the Napkin Academy as well. And there's everything we talk about, the templates, the resources, et cetera, that's all going to be on the show notes page and or on the blog that you can get by just scrolling down on your phone and you can click through as, as we'll have them. My team will put them right on the, on the show notes page for you. Uh, he's also a licensed pilot an avid runner, and a landscape uh, painter himself. So with that, I want to introduce you to Dan Rome and my wonderful conversation with him. Have a great day. Dan, I want to welcome you to the show today. Hi, Bill. How are you? Fantastic. I'm doing great. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. This is going to be a real treat for our listeners today. Um, Let me just give a little overview, and I'd love for you to uh, share a little bit about yourself, but just let everybody know we're here with uh, Dan Rome of Digital Rome Incorporated. Dan is the creative director and author of five international best-selling books on business visualization and communication clarity. I'm just a huge promoter of, of clarity and visualization. This is gonna be fun. For your first book, Back of the Napkin, was named by Fast Company, London Times, and Business Week as Creative Book of the Year. And Draw to Win, which is the one I uh, originally found you in, uh, debuted as a number one book on Amazon in the category of business communication and sales and marketing. And your latest book we're going to be talking about today is Pop-Up Pitch. And uh, I'm I'm going to stop there because I'd love for you to explain um, kind of how things have developed to the point where we've gotten to Pop-Up Pitch and and what led to from (laughs) book one and then finally what we're we're going to talk about today. Uh, Sure, Bill. Well, um, if if I could kind of explain a little bit of the through line of my life, which, which parallels the books, Um, like every one of the people who is listening to this or watching this right now, every one of us, when we were little, we drew because before we were able to read and write the one mechanism of recorded communication that we had and anybody who has kids or ever was a kid knows this to be true is we drew, we took a crayon on a piece of paper and we drew a house and a son and a dog and what have you. I just never stopped doing that. So somehow through the world of management consulting, primarily in technology, uh, a fair amount in financial services, um, a little bit in the entertainment industry. I've, I've had throughout this career the ability to meet people who are very technical in nature or are doing very complicated things in business. And I'm just the crazy guy who went to the whiteboard and started drawing out what I heard people say. And Bill, an amazing thing happened. 
all of the political stuff that might be in the room, all of the kind of the inherent complexity there was, the the desperation that so many of us have to get our entire idea out there so that someone else could see it, it all washes away the moment someone goes to the whiteboard and just draws a couple of circles and a couple of arrows in a box and says, if I understand you correctly, this is what we're trying to do. And one of two things happens. Either everyone says, oh my gosh, that's it. Or they say, well, not quite. And then they pick up the pen and draw the correct picture. And that's the story of all the books and of all my life. And the last piece I'd add, how does this all loop up to this thing where we'll talk about called the pop-up pitch is if you take the visuals that are so important to making complicated things clear, what I've now learned is if you take those simple, simple drawings and weave them together into a story, you end up with the single most powerful way to persuade anybody of anything, which is to tell them a simple visual story. And that's the pop-up pitch. It's, it's really interesting that what, what uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a, a zig here. I'm my kids. Um, my one is a freshman in college and, and I've got one is a sophomore in, in high school. And then I've got one as a, a junior in college as well. But my, uh, my son is the freshman. Uh, I, when he started freshman year of high school, I said, take, take drawing courses. I said, take mm. any type of course you can take that is not traditional. And because he looks at his father, I mean, I was an English major and now, okay. uh, you know, I'm writing, <laughs> uh, all I am is in technology and business, but my, and so that, that is, proved to be, uh, and then my daughter right now is, I guess it, she's in, in high school. She, her best class right now is her drawing class. And this was an elective. And wow. I, said, I said to her, I said, Kayla, you've got to, I said, this is a great, and she's, she's not struggling with it, but she's challenged in it. And, but she, it's a good challenge. And I said, you don't understand these presentations that you're going to may have to give in the future, these, these little tricks and these little tips and these little things you're learning are just going to be helping help you out so much, no matter what, what uh, uh, craft you end up practicing long-term. If I can ask Bill, what, what, uh, what is your daughter studying in school? She's old enough to where she, I'm assuming she's a selected a major. And what does your son want to study? If I might just ask none of my business, but there's a reason why I ask. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So my my uh, my oldest, um, she she's in college. She's speech and language pathology. Oh yeah. Um, and my my youngest, who's in a sophomore in high school. Okay. She she is uh, she's just a sophomore in high school right now, but she's has some classes she can you know take and and uh, that are electives in nature. And then and then my my son is a, a criminology. I, I think he's going to shift. He's going to switch that this year out wow. of criminology. But he's still in that freshman year where I know a lot of people are like, you know, we're putting a ton of money into this education. You need to do something that's super practical. And, and I'm like, listen, take everything. I yeah. said, get a degree, but it means nothing. I mean, it means something, of course, but unless you're going to be my, I said, unless you're going to tell me that you're going to be an engineer or you're going to go into medicine, um, that's a super binary, you know, it, it, or like my daughter is a speech language pathologist. That's a right. fairly direct path. I said, just take, you gotta, you gotta keep your skills wide open. Anyway, that's hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Well, I asked because you said a couple of things as you were talking about your kids and I've got two daughters as well, who are now 22 and 17. So very similar ages to you. One is wrapping up college and one's wrapping up high school. Um, so what I heard is it's, it's really interesting because no matter what area you seek to study, your ability to think about it clearly and communicate it to me is one of the most important things, period. So that's point number one. And then point number two, as you'd mentioned, you know, as you were talking to your daughter about one day, if you have to make a presentation, I would reframe that, Bill, I would say, when you make your presentation, <laughs> because every one of us is increasingly finding, no matter where you are in business, to, by my book, the single most important measure of your success in any aspect of business, whether it's in IT or in finance or in accounting or in medicine, is actually going to be your ability to describe to others what you do and why what you do is valuable to them. So we are always selling and we are always presenting. And neither of those is a dirty word. Um, that is right. what we do. And the best way to do it, without a doubt, the, the data are in, the results are in, the best way to persuade someone to do something is through positive affirmation of benefit. And the best way to do that 
is to tell them a story. And the best story is one told with visual imagery. 100%, 100%. And, it is, and so I've always, uh, so uh, it brings up the acronym of WIFM. I learned quite a mm. number of years. Have you ever heard of the acronym WIFM? No, I don't know what that one is. It's, um, and I originally, I'm four years out of college, I, I sold insurance before I moved into a technology career you know, 30 years ago, 25 years ago. But WIFM stands for what's in it for me, but it's from uh-huh. the, it's from the uh, other person's perspective because they're constantly asking what's in it for me, what's in it for me, what's in it for me. So the, what, what resonated quite a bit with storytelling is, and in, is in, like, what, uh, what is, what is the benefit? to the yep. other person, but it's right. fun, I almost have to do, do a mind meld. Um, so as you were talking in, in going through the introduction, I just couldn't help but think about kids because I think, um, you know, we're ultimately building these, uh, trying to build skilled, critical th- thinkers. And that's why I, I just interviewed a guy the other day who came out of Loyola and he had this great major. It was an English major with a business minor. Yeah. And I specifically reached out to them. I said, I want this kids. I said, I want the kids that are liberal arts trained and, and, uh, and then have some interest. I don't care if the interest is in, they managed uh, a, a, an ice cream shop in the summer, or if they were part of a sports team or part of a club and then they show leadership. Uh, but I want the critical thinking and the thought. And it's yeah. really interesting because I feel like that critical thinking um, it's versus like a business major, where they're just sort of kind of here's your track to run down. I like, I like being able to have abstraction and storytelling often with, when you look at English and literature and these, uh, these arts, you're having to interpret something that was written hundreds of years ago and you could barely understand the English language. And then you're having to understand the context of the time period, the context of the language, and then put it into a modern term that we can all understand. And, yeah. and I, and I find that that type of skill and thinking is sort of um uh, what you're doing from a, from a some, taking complexity and trying to bring it into something that's a manageable uh, story. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting you should bring this up because um, when we were talking earlier, you'd mentioned, Bill, that most much of your audience are people who are in the IT profession, whether it's a CIO or a CISO. And, and um, as I'd mentioned to you, over my career, I've had a, a chance many, many, many times to work with CISOs and CIOs at Microsoft and Google and Intel and, and a, a lot of the Fortune 500. And it's been really fascinating because very often people who move into that field often, not always, but come from maybe a very sophisticated engineering education and will often say to me, I know there's something in this soft skill of storytelling. Can you tell me a little bit? more about why that's important. And you just hit it. And I want to give you a perfect example. Uh, 10 days ago, I was down in Pasadena. I live here in San Francisco. So I was down in Pasadena, just north northeast of LA. Um, and there's a little organization in Pasadena called JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is affiliated with Caltech. Uh, and Jet Propulsion Laboratory, if it's not a household name among your CIOs and CISOs and IT oh, people, yeah. it ought to be. Because if you think about all of the extraplanetary exploration that's going on by NASA, whether it's the Mars rovers uh, going out to Saturn, Voyager, if you remember back in the 1970s and 80s as it went outside the solar system, all of those are systems and tools that were conceived of, designed, built, project managed, and now controlled by the folks at JPL. JPL is a vendor, one of two primary vendors to uh, NASA for true deep space exploration and planetary, planetary exploration as well. So you can imagine that there is no more hardcore of the engineering and scientific mindset than the people who spend their lives literally doing the rocket science. Sure, sure. And what was such a hit was not even, but especially among that audience to realize JPL has one major client. And that client is called NASA. And as time moves on, it becomes increasingly important to be able to sell the vision of your mission to your customer. So in this particular case, the customer is NASA. The vendor is JPL. The JPL people are coming up with brilliant ideas about what we might want to do. And these are projects that that last 30 to 40 years. They cost tens of billions of dollars and they cannot go wrong because if they do, it's, it's not only a vast amount of money gone, but it's national prestige, lack of science. 
You've only got one shot. You got to get it right. Uh, I mean, these are truly, literally moon shots and Mars shots. And talking with these folks, they were saying the same thing, Bill, that you are. I need to share the vision of why, for example, we now need to go to Venus. I need to share that with the folks at NASA and I need to sell them on the idea. And the best way to do it is not the tech. Nobody sure. cares about the features. What people care about is what will we achieve by doing that? What is the benefit? And that's what the story is about. And I know we're going to go there because we chatted about it earlier. The ultimate story in my book, in my, literally in my book, is one that's based on something that we're going to talk about called the hero's journey. But the important part about it is you're going to build this story that you will use to share your complicated idea with someone else in a way that is inspiring and clear by building the story around the hero. But guess what? You as the storyteller are not the hero. Your product is not the hero. The hero is the person to whom it provides the benefit. Yes, it's yes. the customer. I love that. Which is with them. <laughs> there you have it. What's in it for me? What's you, you got me? It's exactly right. I love it. I love. So and, that's and the story we're going to tell. Is I'm going to tell is, you what's in it for you. And and uh, and the more we've gone through this, the CIO, it used to be they used to be hired for keeping the keeping the lights on, mm -hmm. making sure the compute the PCs turned on and the servers. And that came with the job and that was it. That was it. And then you they threw a bunch of projects on your plate and said, finish these projects. And the better you got at the projects and the bigger your ambition was, the more you moved. Now it's changed. Now that's, that's like, okay, the salary, you, you got to keep my lights on. I'm going to give you a bunch of projects. That's done. Now they're actually participating in inventing the future. Yeah. The top innovative CIOs are actually at the table helping craft the future, helping hit the intersection of where we need to be. Here's the customers where, where we need to be. And they're sharing in this and they're, because they know that they're, they're the ones that are going to help make that moonshot happen for the business. And so the influencing or the selling, because uh, God forbid we call the, we call uh, people salesmen right now, but 50%, I've asked 50% of their job is actually influencing people within the organization. Yeah. And, and I, I know that's not a surprise for you, but maybe we can start with, uh, I'd love to, to dive into uh, the hero's journey and and why why you feel that that's like an important um, uh, uh, important for people to understand. So let me let me answer that with a story. Okay. So uh, a few years ago, I was working with a little consulting company called Deloitte. You may have heard of them, and I was working in particular with their information security consulting practice. Uh, and what was really fascinating is the project we we're working on, this is public information, they wouldn't mind me sharing this now, is the realization that when the notion of a board, like the board that oversees any organization, the board, the board is interested long, long term in simply making sure that the business that they represent has longevity and success. And so early on in the history of the board, the, the table stakes were we have to have the CFO on the board. The CFO is going to come and report on financially, how's the business doing? And, and then over time, you might have people coming into the board who are more interested in, say, uh, a balanced scorecard approach to the business. Are our people happy? Do we have some reporting around that? Uh, are our customers happy and satisfied? Great. And then a new turn started in about seven or eight years ago, pre-COVID, where all of the sudden, the biggest single terror of the board of an organization is, are we gonna have a data breach? It wasn't even a problem that the board had ever contemplated any time prior to seven years ago. And then you started to see flagships company, uh, Target, others, Sony, who have massive data breaches and the entire life of the organization is suddenly threatened overnight in a way that it never could have been before. So all of a sudden the board is looking around to say, who's gonna tell us about what we're doing to protect our information, which was that we didn't care before. Well, who gives it? Whatever. Who's, who do we have on staff who knows anything about that? We've got a CISO. Bring them to the board. Mr. Ms. CISO, it's on you. Tell me what are we doing 
in particular, what are you doing to make sure that we don't have a Sony moment? And wow, someone who came out of IT or someone who came out of the role of a CIO, as you're talking about, suddenly is not only at the table with most senior leadership, but is in many ways the number one influencer of some of the biggest, not only technological decisions, but strategic decisions that yeah. the company is making. And it is not a role for which most people who came into the CISO suite were prepared. That's true. And now you're sitting at the big table. You have a place, you, you, you know, you, you're in the room where it happens. What are you going to say? And I'll tell you this, the members of the board and the CEO do not want to hear about the feature set of your latest security solution. They don't care. That's your job. What they want to hear about is have you got our back yeah. and have I got your back? What do you need from me to make sure that that previously unworrisome part of my business is covered? And that's where you better be able to tell that story. And that story is not going to be about technology XYZ. It's going to be about what we historically have done in the past and how we are taking bold moves now to change it because the information security issues that we have today are not the issues that we had before. And the solutions that got us here are not the solutions that are gonna take us into the future. And by the way, what I've just told you, Bill, that's the hero's journey. What is the problem we now face that we have never faced in the past mm -hmm. that is gonna obligate us to take a bold move that has never been done in the past and how to believe in it? And it won't be use the force. It's going to be, how are you going to cover us on this? So I go into it. We can go into how do you tell that story, but does that make sense? What I've just shared? Yeah. And, and just um, from the hero's journey uh, perspective, if we, if we can lay it out. Um, and then I want you to, I think you were going to potentially show um, a visual of that um, on the screen we can share with people. Um, so if someone, if someone uh, has a challenge, typically that's a part of the hero's journey where there's a challenge where there's a stressor that comes to the table, or, yes. or, or it could be a dragon of some sort, some some uh, metaphorical dragon, or in the in the old, in the um, ancient myths, it was a dragon. Mm -hmm. And then and then there's a descent into hell. There's a descent into where where there's trials and tribulations. But then but then there's an ascent, and there's a lesson learned that is shared with the world. Exactly. Uh, and, and so I'd love. And so that's essentially what your coaching us through right now, right? Oh, absolutely. And oh, cool. you, you, you nailed it, Bill. I mean, for those who might not be familiar with this thing called the hero's journey, which is now in the world of storytelling, pretty, pretty much known, known the classic archetype of telling a story. It's, it's worth just sharing for a moment, where did it come from? Um, and that we're going to get way off the territory of IT facts and figures, but we're going to go into a little bit of the world of storytelling, which isn't so different. There was a fellow named Joseph Campbell, uh, who uh, lived most of the 20th century, most of the 20th century. And um, there's a great PBS NewsHour special with him that's now 20 years old with uh, 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 Jim Lair, I believe. Yeah, it's yeah. really worth watching. Joseph Campbell was an anthropologist and political scientist, and he spent all the way from the 1930s through the 1990s traveling the world because he loved to collect myths from all of the great cultures and all of the great historic periods of the human record. What are the stories that survive, not just dozens of years, but hundreds or maybe thousands of years? And he was fascinated by them because no matter where he would go, whether it was to the Middle East, whether it was to South Asia, whether it was to South America, whether it was to Mesoamerica, whether it was to Eastern Europe, he would find that everybody was telling essentially the same grand story. And it's the one we're talking about. He coined a term for it. He called it the monomyth, yeah, yeah. which took on sort of a more popular notation, notion of being called the hero's journey, which is not really what he wanted to call it. But he wrote a book in, I want to say it's the late 50s, called The Hero with a Thousand Faces that mapped out the characters and the line, the series of steps, the arc of the story, the beginning, the middle, the end, and that turning point that you just talked about at the middle where there's an enormous crisis which has entered in. And in order to survive it, you have to learn something new. And it's the act, as you pointed out, of slaying that dragon or dealing with COVID 
or sure. dealing with the pending security breach. It's what you did in that moment of darkness and what you learned and how you didn't die that is what enables you to then grow and mature as an individual, as a culture, as an organization. That's like the turn of, of the story. It's utterly fascinating. And what made it part of sort of the public lingo was there was this kid who grew up in the 1940s, who lived in middle America, out on a ranch, bored, loved to race cars, <laughs> loved to draw pictures of cars, got himself in a car crash when he was 17 years old and died. But luckily was resurrected because uh, people got to the crash site. The doctors came and were able to get his heart started. And in the hospital as he was recovering, which took months and months, this kid kind of realized he felt like he'd been given an extra day every day by having gone through literal death. And in that extra day, he realized that as he looked around in the world, he realized that people who worked together did better and have better lives than people who fought each other. Mm -hmm. And he decided that he wanted to make part of his life's journey, the telling of that story. And so he decided to make a movie and he couldn't sell the movie to anybody because he wanted to make an optimistic movie. And this is in the 1970s when movies were cynical and kind of depressing. So he said, screw it. Nobody wants to make an adult movie. So I'm going to make the movie for kids. And in particular, I'm going to make this story for me when I was a kid and I was lost and the world was too big for me. And he remembered reading Joseph Campbell's book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, this kid did. And he said, that would probably be a really good way to tell my story. So he went and dusted off the hero's journey and wrote a little movie called Star Wars. <laughs> And that was George Lucas. And history would prove that the use of the hero's journey line for line, beat for beat, every character in Star Wars is a caricature of one of the archetypes that has existed in every unforgettable myth throughout history. Luke is the hero who doesn't want to be one, who's called forward to slay the dragon. The dragon, in this case, is Darth Vader and the Death Star and has to learn how to do it, and has a wizard who's there on his side, Obi-Wan, who's telling him, in this new world that you don't know, I'm going to give you some secrets on how to navigate it. And that movie changed entertainment history. And all the films that we love that have followed it, whether they're Harry Potter or the Marvel comic universe or the Hunger Games. Or J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling, absolutely. They didn't invent it. And this is kind of the, I get so passionate. I love it so much. This is the story for your folks. You don't have to invent a new story line to tell the best story that the board has ever heard. It's right here. And all I've done in the pop-up pitch is break that storyline down yeah. into 10 steps, modernize it a little bit with the latest in business thinking, weave in some behavioral economics, the idea being that we as humans, we think we're rational, but we're not. But the ways in which we're irrational are very predictable. The science is there. So if you take the old hero's journey, some behavioral economics and some good old Dale Carnegie style positive persuasion, how to win friends and influence people, you come up with what I call the, the 10 page pitch which is the core of the whole story. And I can share it with you if yeah, you want to. Let's do that. And I think uh, this, uh, as you, as you pull it up on the screen, I think this also dovetails with, with the, uh, you know, there's a big push now to develop uh, these EQ skills. And, um, and I think it's an interesting, uh, as, as we build, build this uh, really looking into the storyline here. Um, oh, great. Great. Okay. So, we're looking so, at so Bill, can you pitch. see this on screen now? Sh yes. So what we're looking at right now, uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm kind of a technical guy myself. I like to put things into processes and repeatable schemes, and I'm a model builder for systems, and I love systems thinking. Um, and so what you're looking at here is if you imagine that the story is going to start over here, and it's actually going to start right at this point right here, and it's going to end over here. And as we go from beginning to end, we're going to go through a series of steps. And intentionally, this is that hero's journey deconstructed and broken down into a set of 10 sequential statements, each one of which is intended to evoke a different emotion. 
You might call it manipulation. The better way to call it is intentional persuasion by understanding how human beings think. And so what you do is here's, I'll go through it real quick. On your title page, you just established clarity. Bill, you and I are going to talk about this today. Then on this slide two. In your CISO example, this could be, I want to prepare for my first board meeting sure. um, where I've got an influence. And I just want to be really clear about what it is. So, the, yeah. yeah, you don't have to call it Star Wars. You might just want to call it how we're going to succeed in an information insecure world or something, whatever. You don't have to be super clever. You just state, here's what I want to talk about. And then you establish trust with your audience on page two. Then you evoke fear. You have to, because the most influential of all human emotions is arguably fear. And this is why all these movies work. This is why Luke's parents had to die on Tatooine in order to motivate him to get off that planet and start to live the life he was intended to live. Because then at the other side of it, you have hope. Fear leads to hope. But guess what? We hope this hope feels wonderful, but we are not going to get there doing what we've done before. Mm -hmm. We can hope that everything's going to work. Sure. We can hope that we don't get hacked. And it's going to feel really, really good when that hope is reality, but it ain't going to happen if we don't do something. The sobering reality is the world is scarier than it has ever been. And it's at this pit of despair right here, Bill. This is the part we were talking about. Right, right. This inflection point from we can't do it the way we used to do it to coming up with a bold, audacious move yep. that this time just might work. What's the bold move? And, and it, we're at, uh, for those of you that can't see this, we've, we've now gone from the hope, which is a, an upward trajectory, and then crashed. There's a sobering reality of, of, uh, of real life and the real uh, threats that are faced. And then you have this block called audacious reality. The, I guess is where this is where the 10x sort of mindset picks up right here. The, and, and, for, and you got it. And this, for those of us that do have a solution to sell or an idea to persuade, this is the first moment where we actually get to introduce our product because the bold move this time is, and then insert whatever you as CIO, IT manager, CISO, whatever it is that you need to persuade someone to fund you or listen to you. Now you introduce it. And then you say, we know we can actually do it. Even though it sounds a little crazy or bold, we actually can do it because and then you insert, it's not so different from what we've done before, or someone else has done it before and approved that it worked. Then all we need to do is commit to agree is to it. We can make this thing happen, establish what's going to be an early reward by committing to this alternate path. There has to be some kind of near-term reward. I can't wait for the whole solution to appear five years from now. There's going to be an immediate cost savings or an immediate understanding of something we hadn't seen before. And that is what drives us to the long win or the true aspirational goal, which is the end of the story. And by the time you get here, you don't have a dry eye in the house, guaranteed. People will be saying, holy smoke, Bill, why didn't we ever do this before? How could we not yeah. do this? And then the beauty of it, and I'll stop and, 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 and uh, take a pause. It's 10 pages that you are going to put together. It's super programmatic. And I've actually created a template that's just fill in the blanks. Yep, it takes yep. you through the whole 10. And when you're done, you will tell this entire story in about seven minutes. This is not a 90 minute presentation. This is not even an hour long PowerPoint. This is a seven minute presentation. It could be PowerPoint. It could be you reading from index cards. It could be you standing on the boardroom table and just sharing the story, however, whatever you want is your style, which will come as you practice it. The intent is get this dramatic story out in seven minutes or less. And then you've got the whole remaining 53 minutes of that hour long time slot to discuss the details and how we're actually going to do it. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to put this uh, on the on the blog so that also so that you, if those of you listening to this on the phone can scroll down and see what, what uh, Dan just went through here visually uh, so that you can kind of see it and then uh, uh, how this arc works. I, I uh, you know, PowerPoint can be just a mess. I mean, because so much is done in Zoom these days. And and I think what I what I love is it, this is a 
gives people hope for for create gives people hope for creating a powerful impact and taking a step back. I, I how much I did this for my board meeting recently. I went through this step because I wanted to test it and have fun with it, and I found it very. Uh, and and you you had said it takes about I think about two two hours to put this 10, 10, this 10 slides or 10 uh, page template together yeah. uh, that essentially you'll deliver in seven minutes, but it was a, it was a very thoughtful uh, process and that you just pop to a different screen and maybe, maybe you can uh, go through that. Sure. Well, well, Bill, as I wrote this book, the pop-up pitch, I'm super cognizant of the fact that nobody in business has time anymore. Point one and point two is nobody on the audience side is paying attention in the way we used to, whether it's because of Zoom or remote meetings or it, it. The issue is every time any one of us is presenting right now, we're effectively competing with the entire world because all I need to do is look at my phone and I'm distracted. So we've got two things working against us that are new. One is we don't have enough time to really invest in making a giant presentation and our audience is so stretched for their own attention. So as I wrote the 10 page pitch, I said to myself, I wanna be able to provide a super tactical and super practical template toolkit that a busy business person can use in less than two hours to create what is effectively going to be the most persuasive presentation they've ever given. And after they've spent two hours preparing it, only two hours, that presentation will be less than seven minutes long. And it will be highly visual and it will be based on this story. So what we're looking at right now on the screen, for those who can see it, it might be obvious, but for those who are just listening, the 10 turns of that storyline that we just talked about, I've converted into a 10 page templated document. So if you're a PowerPoint person or a Google Docs person or a Microsoft Word person, whatever tool you're going to use to prepare your remarks, the template is already fixed for you. And here's the 10 steps. All you need to do is fill them in with one to three sentences each. And if you really want to go to town, then as I've done on my whiteboard here, the simple sketches that you can see to amp up each point in the journey. Um, and, and the good news is, Bill, that, that to get these templates, they're free. I put them on my website. Um, so if you just anybody wants to go to danrome.com. These templates are available for download for free. The full PowerPoint with all of the suggestions, all of the speaker notes, um, everything's there. Just download it and fill. It's literally a fill in the blanks that takes, as you said, all in less than two hours to put together. Great resource. What a great resource. I, um, you know, I, I think that we are, you get inundated with information. And, and I think uh, a lot of the folks uh, are sort of, uh, they're managing through, it's not managing through fear, but there's so much, um, it, it, you have to take a step back and look at, and look at these presentations from a strategy point of view. It's, it's seven slides, but the following this narrative arc actually lets you get out of your uh, uh, emergency brain, it gets out of the fear and into really what is it the story I'm trying to tell and what is the impact that I want to make? It's really thinking it through from the end in mind. It's no different. My son's on the soccer team um, up at Penn State. And, you know, we don't want to just make the team. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to be a starting, we want to be a starter, game one, uh, day, day one, game one for the team of 35 guys that are going to be going right at each other, hardcore yeah. to win a starting spot. And, and then a higher level thinking is we don't just want a starting spot. We want to be a starter on the big 10 championship team, which they just won this weekend. Nice. I want to be a starter on the, but, but I think that you, we've got to look at this from a leadership perspective. It's like, what's your ambition for this presentation? Are yeah. we just checking the box or are we actually going to go in there and, and completely dominate. I like, think I'm, I'm like, and I know I didn't I don't know if I read that from your book, but the more we think, I'm really talking about this with you. I'm like, we really need to from a scene, like, what is it the objective? And yes, we're living busy lives, but this might not be for every presentation, but the ones that you need to win, we need to follow this. Bill, that's it. That's it. And I'm going to add that up. If you don't care about your presentation, if you then then I don't care. 
if you care about it, if it is worth the time for your audience, then it is worth you taking the two hours to make sure that it's good. Why would we do a throwaway presentation? And this is going to be a very, very strange analogy, but just bear with me for a moment. Um, I'm a pilot. Okay, fine. So I have my private pilot's license. I've flown all my life. My mom and my dad were both pilots. For anybody who's ever flown, whether it's on a small plane or on a commercial airliner, you know that the person on a commercial airliner, you know that the captain of the plane, he or she's got probably seven to 15,000 hours of flying time, has probably done something on the approach of 10,000 landings in, in his or her life. Which is the landing where they say, this is the one I don't care about? It never happens. Think about the analogy. There is no presentation you're going to give that's the one that you don't care about. It's not that your life matters every time you're giving a presentation, but if this one doesn't matter, why are you giving it? Why are you wasting anybody else's time and your own if you don't have a story to tell? The next time someone says, give me the report, do not give them the report in a meeting. Just send them the friggin' email because if someone just wants the information, what are the two things that I need to know? Just send it to them. But if, some, if you need to persuade them that those two things really matter, take the two hours yeah. to make it matter. What, we're insane. Otherwise, no wonder most business life these days is meeting hell because we don't consider, is this meeting important? And if it's not that important, let's not do it. Let's save the time and figure out a more efficient way to get the information across. But if it's worth having the meeting, let's make it matter. Yeah. And, and be, be the person on that senior team. Not every, I know you're working with some of the bigger, bigger companies and bigger brands. Not all CIOs are. And they're fighting for credibility at the table. They're fighting for a seat at the table. They're fighting, if they have a seat at the table, they're fighting to maintain their seat at the table. Yeah. And, and what if, what if the way we communicate made all the difference in the world? Just what if? I want to play that up, Bill. What if, <laughs> what if, what if at the end of your presentation about information security or a new IT system, or let's make a move to the cloud and which cloud should it be? What if at the end of that presentation that was nominally about an IT opportunity, at the end of that presentation, everybody in the room said, holy smoke, that guy's actually the most persuasive communicator we have in the whole company. We need him or her at every meeting. Yes, yes. Isn't that what we all want you but to see, talk that's, about? That's beginning that's with it. the end in mind. That's visualizing the end, right? Yeah. And I love it. Oh, this is great. I think I, I just love this. And, and um, Dan, I think let's just take this opportunity. Is there anything that we've said, I, we've talked about that you're like, God, I wish Bill would ask this question um, or anything that you just wanted to wrap up with as far as kind of a, a bookend for the conversation we've had today? Well, Bill, thank you so much for inviting me. As, as I hope you can see, I truly, truly love this mission that I've been able to find for myself in life. And I like to tell the story about how I got to it using my own hero's journey in which I'm not the hero, but the people I get to share this with are. And I would just land it like this. There's kind of three things that I would encourage someone who's inspired by what we're talking about. Um, by all means, I've got a new book out. If someone feels like buying the book, please buy the pop-up pitch. I'd appreciate it. And, and it's a good book. Uh, the second thing is uh, for people who'd like to, a little bit, to know a little bit more, I've actually got an online academy. I've been running it, founded it 10 years ago. It's called napkinacademy.com. And uh, it's a service uh, I've had over time, more than 6,000 people subscribing. And it's uh, an opportunity to learn these tools on your own time. And then the third thing, of course, is if anybody's interested in the templates themselves, they're free. Please go to danrome.com and download them for free. They will help. Well, this uh, Dan, th thank you for, for for sharing that. And those are just real tangible resources for for everybody. Uh, I'm myself going to go to Napkin Academy because I've done the books, but I'm I've, I'm also I know my learning style is um, uh, is I love uh, not only the, the text, but I love seeing the the visual coming in. So I'm going to hit that myself. But um, I, I really appreciate you for, for this because I think that this is a, a really great inflection point for a lot of leaders and another tool in their tool belt that's something that we're not taught in college. We're not taught, um, many, of, many of us are years beyond college anyway, 
but there's enough data out there to support us for the rest of time. It's it's telling our story and influencing and persuading that's going to make the biggest difference for people moving forward. So I think that your book is 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 helping people depending on their ambition and depending where they want to go. It's helping really move the arc of not only the individuals listening, but the businesses that get impacted by this and the decisions they get made. So I want to thank you for that. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Well, until next time. Thanks, Dan. All right. Take care.